Uh, hi, so I'm Colin Ross and uh, I work here at the shelter and I just glanced like really quickly at your uh, intake materials. Right. I want to spend maybe 15 or 20 minutes with you right now and then meet with you and your kids at greater length probably like three-ish this afternoon. Okay. So, uh, well, let me just start by telling you, um, we're, we're done. I'm done with this. We're out of there. I, I promise my kids, if this happens again, that that's it. I mean, I, I have promised and we are, we are, we are done. We're out. I'm, I'm, I'm sick of it. I can see by your eye. He beat you pretty good this time. I mean, that that's it. That's the last time. What well, just to kind of fill me in and give me the background. Uh, what, what was it that kind of led up to him beating you up this time? What was going I on? I mean, just whatever he can come up with. And what was it this time? Um, I did not have dinner on the table when uh, he got home. And he's... Well, actually lunch. I'm sorry. It was lunch time. Oh. And uh, why was that? What was going on? Well, you know, I mean, very rarely do I get to just go out. The kids didn't have to go to school. It was a, it was a um, teacher's work day, so I had the kids that day. We just went to the park. We were just enjoying the park. And I walked off and forgot my watch. I was just enjoying my kids, and we just just lost to do. just lost track of time. Hmm. And he works construction, right? Yes, he's uh, he's a foreman. And even with the economy, he's been pretty busy recently. Actually, we've been fairly fortunate. So yeah, he's been still busy. And so he comes home, dinner's not ready, and then does he blow up immediately, or? Well, here's the deal. I mean, he is hypoglycemic, he's got a lot of stuff going on, and he works so many hours that he, I mean, he only has like this narrow window where he can actually, he can get something to eat. And so, I mean, in all honesty, he does, he does work very, very hard. He works very long hours. Um, and there's, there's just a small window of time. So he has to come home and eat, and if he doesn't have anything ready to eat, then he gets kind of shaky, and he gets, gets kind of dizzy feeling he does it so he just needs to have something to eat and I just I mean in all honesty knowing that I mean I really should have picked up my watch because I mean that's really all I have to do he did I mean I just need to fix his meals for him and make sure he has food and it would have just taken like an just a, like an hour it wouldn't have been that big a deal I just I mean can I just comment on something here um, I've noticed a really quite noticeable shift in your body language, tone of voice, posture, from very assertive, confident, like we're done with this, we're not going to take this anymore, to almost a more apologetic kind of uh, way of describing things. And we seem to be shifting towards it's almost kind of a little bit your fault. Well, I mean, I don't, it's just, I mean, you asked me what happened and I kind of dropped the ball on that piece of it. So, I mean, that part of it is my fault. I mean, okay. that's just being responsible. Um, I, I can't remember for sure, but when I was looking at your intake materials, I think this is the seventh or eighth time you've been to the shelter? I'm not counting. I don't but remember. Quite a few times. And so the previous times, what happened? I imagine that you came in pretty assertive. I'm done with this. I'm not going to take any more like you were a few minutes ago. But then something must have happened. You must have Well, shifted. he starts calling and he yeah. apologizes and he says, I mean, I mean, we have kids and I don't even have a, I mean, I have a, my GED. I mean, what, I mean, we have a really nice home and the kids are in really nice schools and. What would happen, do you think, of course you don't know for sure, but what do you think would happen if you did separate for good? I would have to live with my parents and they live in a bad part of town and the kids would go to a, different school and I mean they don't, they can barely support themselves I mean it wouldn't it's not like a real so there's a lot of reasons why it would make sense to stay with him and to keep going back except for the fact that he keeps beating you so there's what I'm saying is there's positives the way against the negative it sounds like it's the positives that draw you back well that and and I mean he's not always like that he can be very charming and loving and nice and I mean it's not always horrible. No, I'm sure it isn't. No, so just to fill me in a little bit more completely, give me a kind of sketch of what it was like at home when you were growing up, when you were just a kid. Oh, I mean it was horrible. I mean, my father was a 
horrible, horrible alcoholic, and it was bad. It was always bad. So he was not like a quiet, kind of happy no. type drinker. He was angry, violent? Yeah. He was fine. He was very nice until he would drink, and when he would drink, he just was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I mean, he just would get crazy and violent. Would he drink outside the home, come home drunk, or be, <coughs> excuse me, at home or both? Or? Kind of both. I think he'd start on with the guys after work and then keep drinking when he got home. But he'd come home a lot of times just like a crazy man. Was he physically violent with, there was you and your sister, right? Yes. Was he physically violent with you guys or with your mom or both? No, he never was. I mean, I could tell one time he thought about hitting me, but my mom got in the middle of it. My sister and I just knew to hide. I mean, we went into the closet every time and we would just wait. And when would you know it was time to hide? What would be going on? Um, basically, he'd pull up. You could, right. I mean, you could tell by the way he drove into the driveway if it was going to be bad. And was there anything that you would do to try and like settle things down or reduce the risk of him blowing up? Um, yeah, I mean, we just would like make sure all of our stuff was picked up and basically try to make the house like um, there were no children. It's like we weren't supposed to exist, so we got everything put up in its right place. And did that kind of help some? Yeah, I mean, until I mean, one time I um. I forgot to put the remote control of the TV back on the arm of his chair and he came in and he couldn't find it and I could hear him and I remembered, I remembered that it was, I had put it someplace else, I think it was under the sofa when I was playing and knocked it underneath there and he just went berserk, started screaming and just lost it and attacked my mom and it was just terrible. I mean it was, it was literally, it was literally, he beat her so bad that night because he could not find the remote. And did you and your sister take off to the closet? Oh, we were already in there when he came right. in the door. Oh, I gotcha. Now, I realize that there's differences, but I'm struck by some similarities in the pattern here between your childhood and your marriage. So well, my husband's not, he does not drink at all. I mean, he's not like that. He's not, that's, that was one thing I said for sure, and his health won't let him. I don't, I don't want to marry a man that drinks. I don't want to repeat that. Right. I don't want an alcoholic. So there's clear differences. Now you're an adult, then you were a child. Now we're talking about your husband, then it was your father. Uh, your father drank, your husband didn't. So those are clear differences. But the similarity in pattern seems quite striking to me, which is you're in a situation where things are you know, not bad, like your dad works and there's food on the table and there's a roof over your head and so on. And then not rarely, the whole situation blows up you try and do this or that or try and calm things down or try and be as good as possible and that helps a little but no matter what the blow up comes then you and your sister are off in the closet and then when things are kind of calmed down you're back in the home again again trying to be a good girl do what you can to prevent the blow up and the cycle just repeats itself over and over which is basically the same cycle as you're in now you come to the shelter at the beginning of this conversation, you're very definite, assertive, I'm not taking this anymore, I'm done with this, which is good to hear. But then on the previous visits here, you go through a process where you seem to shift more to, well, if only I'd done this, and if only I'd done that, and here's the reasons he's under stress, and here's this, and here's that, and here's what would happen if I did separate. And it seems like yeah, but I'm supposed to come here. That's what this place is for. Absolutely. And I mean, from what they tell me, a lot of women go through this. Well, basically everybody who comes here. But what I'm trying to look at is the similarity in the pattern for a reason I'll get to in a second. So just like in childhood, there'd be a big blow up. You're out of there. You're in the closet, which is kind of the equivalent of the ba this, this shelter here. Then the storm kind of settles, and then you start figuring out the reasons why it makes sense to go back, which when you were a kid, you were just trapped there. But the reasons have to do with how you're going to improve your performance, how you're going to be a better wife, and then along with that is kind of letting him off the hook. And then you think of the positive things about him, which are real and true. You think of all the stress and all the change and all the disruption would happen if you did separate, and then you're back, and then things go well for a while then he beats you again, then you're here. It's the same cycle repeating itself over and over and over and over. So what I would like to talk to you about at greater length tomorrow is 
just going around and around and around on this sounds like an extremely miserable way to live. And I think to have a more successful outcome, we need to s see the pattern clearly and start brainstorming on how could you step out of the pattern by either, I mean, in a theory, there's two options. One is you just get separated, stay separated, get divorced, the marriage is over. Or you start really setting some boundaries and some limits on him, some rules. He gets into therapy. Uh, he really takes responsibility for his behavior. My, my mother said that he's going to kill me if this happens again, that I shouldn't give him any more chances at all. And if that's true, and that does, obviously that does actually happen, then you definitely should not go back to him. But that's also been a risk and a possibility all the previous times you've gone back to him. Well, I think it's getting worse each time it happens. So all the more reason we need to look at this pattern. And because there's all the reasons why you should leave and all the feelings and all the energy that goes along with that. But then there's also the feelings that draw you back. And if you don't kind of look at both sides of the equation and see the whole pattern, then you tend to just repeat the pattern, which I don't want to see happen. But that's the problem I have is there's, there's both sides and I don't... Exactly. That's why it's a difficult problem. That's why it hasn't been solved yet. So what am I supposed to do different? Well, that's what I want to talk to you about uh, starting three-ish this afternoon, maybe. We'll get into it in more detail. I just wanted to get a kind of a, a quick overall look at the situation. Yeah, I never thought about it being the same. I just thought about it being different. I just always thought I didn't marry an alcoholic, so it's not the same. I never thought of it being similar to when I was little. Okay, so just kind of process that, think about that, mull it over and we'll pick up from here in the afternoon. Is that okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's a very good thing that you came here for you and your kids. And like I said, I just would, number one, like to see you not repeat the pattern one more time here. Have something be different, have a better outcome. I agree. Good. Uh, I think there's a class coming up that you're scheduled to go to. Did they tell you about that yeah. already? Okay, good. So. Uh, might might see you briefly at lunch, otherwise at 3. Okay. Good. See you then. Well, thanks for uh, coming in for an assessment. Um, I really feel uncomfortable with this. I just want you to know, I mean, I just, I just cannot believe I'm here, but my wife really, really wants me to be here, so. I feel very uncomfortable. Yeah, she said when she called that there was something that happened in the backyard that triggered off her making this referral. I mean, it happens all the time, but I mean, it went, this time it was a little bit worse, and you would just think at my age, I would have worked through this, resolved it, I could, this wouldn't be bothering me anymore, but um, I mean, a lot of my buddies still, I just, I just really feel uncomfortable being here. Because you were in Vietnam early 70s, right? Yes. And so what was it that happened in the backyard? This was just last weekend, right? Well, yeah. I mean, we were just, it's, it's not that big a deal. I mean, everybody just gets so ups worked up about this. Um, we were we were just barbecuing, and I was barbecuing, and I, we have two older boys, and um, they were down and had their girlfriends with them. So I was outside, and I was in charge of the, the grill, which I always do, and apparently there was like a uh, ac traffic accident, and there was a news helicopter that went overhead and it just I mean it's just it's like that I just I mean something in me I just react um, and I um, just kind of kind of went dove I guess my wife said into the the bushes um, just like this automatic response I can't always control and, and what, that happens what were a lot you thinking and feeling just before you dove under the bush I don't think I thought anything I know I didn't think anything were you so you weren't seeing pictures or having thoughts or memories no, of it's Vietnam just, at all? It's, well, I mean, I mean, I guess somewhere. I just, all I know is I hit the ground. I don't really feel like there was a, if there was much going on up there, I would have told myself this is crazy. Okay. So I just dove in and, and the part that got them so worried is my son was trying to talk to me and I guess I embarrassed him in front of his girlfriend and he was trying to, I mean, I, I kind of remember him shaking me and when I came to, I just remember having my, I was, I almost, I mean, I came close to hitting my son, and, and that really upset and worried everybody. And I've never done that before, so it should be getting better. I don't know why it's getting worse. 
sometimes it takes a long, long time. Um, so that I mean, nobody got hurt. I didn't. No, I, I didn't that. hit anybody. Okay. Um, was there something in particular that happened in Vietnam? I'm sure there was lots, but that disturbed you the most. I mean, don't you think talking about this now just, I mean, doesn't that just make things worse? Not talking about it hasn't helped it go away. We know that much. And we know from a lot of studies that talking about it, in fact, can relieve a lot of the stress and the pressure. I just feel like sometimes talking about it makes, makes it just makes it feel worse on the inside. It can feel worse to a degree temporarily as you're working your way through it. Yeah, no question. But if it just made it permanently worse, it, it wouldn't be any sense even starting. Well, I think the hardest thing for me was um, losing my buddy. I think that was the hardest. How did that happen? Um, he was shot. He was shot by a sniper. And what was going on kind of immediately before that? Were you there at the time? Yes, I was there. And we were going through the jungle, and it was kind of a marshy area. And we had to use our, we had these little, little machetes to clear out the, all the growth. And um, we were paying close attention because we knew we were probably not in the best place, but we hadn't heard anything for a few days, so we, I guess we kind of, kind of let our guard down and my cigarettes, I was swinging my arm and I knocked my cigarettes out of my pocket and they landed in the water and I just thought to myself, I don't want them to get wet. So I bent over to pick them up and it was just stupid. I mean, it was just stupid. I mean, I picked the stupid cigarettes over paying attention and that's when I heard everything and I felt it and I saw it and I just... So when you bent over to pick up the cigarettes, that's when your buddy got shot? Yes. By the sniper? Yes. And what do you think would have happened if you hadn't dropped cigarettes, hadn't been over to get them? Uh, he'd be alive. That's a fact. I'd have seen it. I would have seen it. I was like one of the best. I could spot these people. I, I, I was excellent. I had excellent. I had almost, I could hear a pin drop. I'm, I was the best person to go out with. And after the shot, then what happened? Did you find the sniper? Did you take him out or take cover or what happened? No, he got away. Um, and I sat with my friend while he died. And do you feel or believe that your carelessness, well, you basically said, you feel that his, your carelessness and lack of focus directly caused your buddy to die? It was your fault? Yes. And uh, do you have flashbacks or nightmares of that incident? I, I used to have, what, what are you calling flashbacks? So like a really sudden rush of, it's almost like you're back there, you see the scene, you hear, smell, I don't, I had it. those for a long time afterwards. Um, those have pretty much, I mean, that's why I don't like to talk about it, because when mm -hmm. I talk about it, they start coming back. So right. I had a period of time where that really went away, but it, it, it seems to bother me more when I'm sleeping, like I dream about it a lot or I have nightmares about it. That's never changed. The, the stuff while I'm awake, doesn't bother me as much, but the stuff when I'm asleep, I don't even like to sleep, man. I just can't even stand to go to sleep. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, and that's a very, very common aspect of post-traumatic stress. Uh, and I've talked to quite a few people of uh, Vietnam and other uh, combat theater veterans going through s pretty similar stuff. And a, a theme that seems to crop up over and over and over and over is, of course, there's lots and lots of horrible stuff that happen. But there's maybe one particular incident that's the most extreme, the most traumatic. And the thing that crops up over and over as a theme is self-blame. In this situation, something bad happened, somebody died, and somehow it was my fault, which clearly is what you feel. Um, and there's several sort of aspects to this. One is when you're sitting here in the present and you're looking back at the past, of course, hindsight is perfect. So now we know for a fact that if you hadn't dropped the cigarettes, you wouldn't have bent over. That's just a fact, right? 
but you're adding on a little bit more to that, which is if you hadn't dropped the cigarettes, you hadn't bent over, then the sniper would not have shot your buddy. But I don't see why that's the case. Because I would have seen him. Okay. I would have been paying attention. I would have seen the sniper. So all military forces have snipers, right? And often I ask dumb questions on purpose to make a point. So here's a dumb question. Do all military forces have snipers because snipers never have any success and never do any good? Well, obviously not, right? But I, I was, I was like the best. I could always hear them. I, they never got past me. Everybody right. wanted to go with me. So you saved probably your own life and a bunch of buddies' lives by being very good at spotting Absolutely. snipers I and taking I them out. I think I was the best. I really do. So back to my question, do snipers ever have success? Of course. They just so don't when I'm there. A lot, but we know for a fact not 100% of the time. But that was my error. I understand that. But how do you know for an absolute fact, because snipers do have success, and no matter how skilled you are, and people die in war, how do you know for an absolute fact that guaranteed certain you would have spotted that guy and that wouldn't have been an occasion where the sniper had success no matter which way you were looking because snipers are highly skilled people. Well, I, mean, I guess that's the dilemma. I never will know. Right. And that's the point I'm making. You've been operating as if you know for sure that you would have spotted them and therefore it is your fault. But what if you don't know for sure? It's a possibility, but what if you don't know for sure? What if what's actually true is kind of the flip opposite, which we don't know for sure either. Maybe what's actually true is that sniper was so well hidden and so skilled that even if you had not dropped the cigarettes, had not bent over, you wouldn't have spotted him and your buddy would have died anyway. How do you know that's not true? And I, I think you're agreeing with me and you're saying that you don't, bottom line, know 100% for sure which way it would have worked out. Right. And this is something, whether the trauma is military combat or civilian car wreck, natural disaster, one of the things that's so overwhelming and horrible about it is the powerlessness and the helplessness. And just as human beings, we frequently, frequently blame ourselves, just because that's the way our minds operate. But also, if you blame yourself, then you weren't powerless and helplessness powerless and helpless, you actually had control of the situation, you just kind of slacked off and lost your focus. And the reason people hold on to the self-blame... Which that's not, that's inexcusable. It's inexcusable for a perfect superhuman creature from another planet. But human beings are not perfect and do make mistakes. But we don't even know for a fact that you made a mistake that resulted in your buddy's death. It's a possibility, but we don't know it for a fact. The other possibility is you did not have the power or the control to spot that sniper because he was too well hidden, too skilled. You did not have the power and the control over the situation as a whole, and there was nothing you could have done to prevent your friend's death. That's possible. And that powerlessness and helplessness is so overwhelming and so intolerable that people just don't want to go there. So they hold on to self-blame, to hold on to the feeling that they have power. It doesn't feel like I have power. It's a horrible feeling to think that it was my fault. Right, and that's the problem. It's not, the problem's not that it's your fault. The problem is that it wasn't your fault. How do you know? Just because I've talked to many, 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 many people and your situation is a little ambiguous. Maybe it's possible that if you hadn't bent over, you would have spot the sniper, but you know, you're not even sure exactly where he was positioned. So the odds sound kind of low. But I've spoken with many people where there's no possibility whatsoever that they could have seen it, avoided it, escaped it, prevented it. And they still blame themselves intensely. So with you, there's a little ambiguity, a little question mark. But I think this, this theme of self-blame, it's not fair to you. 
Because you were over there, you were serving your country. Well, it wasn't fair to him to die. There's nothing fair about it. But it's not fair to you when you were doing your absolute best to preserve your life, his life, carry out your duties. People die. Accidents happen, deaths happen on purpose, that's war. So how do people get over it? How do I get over it? Well, one decision is whether you deserve to get over it. Or do you deserve to be punished forever with flashbacks, fears, nightmares, as punishment for causing your buddy's death? Well, as long as I'm alive, I think about the fact that he is not. And which would be better? Let's look at it from his point of view. Let's say he's, I don't know if you're a church goer, but let's say he's in heaven watching, listening to the conversation. Do you think he's going, yeah, keep on suffering, keep on tormenting yourself, keep on blaming yourself, that's what I want to see? You think that's what he wants for you? No. I think he probably wishes he was alive. Of course he does. But given that he isn't, do you think he would prefer that you let go of the self-blame? Maybe that would be a way of honoring him. What do you mean? That at least you get to have a life. You get to be free of the torment. At least somebody gets to enjoy their life. He, he was robbed of the opportunity. Why should you be robbed on top? If it wasn't your fault. And you don't deserve the punishment. Well, I haven't thought about it like that, but... And the, the other thing I want to touch on here, just briefly, we'll go into this in a lot more detail, and you don't just talk about these things once. You have to go over it a few times, or a few dozen times. But how do you, so you have children and grandchildren? Mm -hmm. and I'm, again, I'm going to ask a dumb question on purpose. Do you feel kind of, yeah, whatever happens, happens, it doesn't matter if they get hurt and injured? Well, that's why I'm so upset about the thought of, striking out at my own son really right really so you would do me. whatever you could to protect them of course just like you would have done you did do whatever you could do to protect your buddy right if we don't say that it was your fault that he died you did the maximum you could i guess so one reason that people stay stuck in the flashbacks nightmares uh, just being kind of revved up hyper vigilant scanning looking for danger, always on edge, not able to relax, not able to go to sleep. One reason people stay in that uh, hyper-aroused, adrenaline, fight-flight kind of state is back then you made a mistake. You kind of slacked off, you weren't focused, you didn't pay attention, you weren't on hyper-alert, and as a result of that slip-up, your friend died. And then people make a vow never to make that mistake again. In order never to make that mistake again, you have to have flashbacks or nightmares to review what happened to make sure you see the mistake you made before so you can remind yourself not to make that mistake again. I don't, I don't think that fits for me because I don't think Doesn't about fit? any of that stuff. What about in the nightmares? No, but I mean, I've never thought I need to do this so that I can prevent that or... It's not that you sit down and kind of write some notes to yourself and then it all consciously plays out. This is just the way it kind of rolls in oh, your you mind. Oh, you mean like unconsciously or something? Yeah, sort of unconscious. Not that incredibly unconscious, but yeah. So like in the back of my mind, you think I'm trying to... Prevent future harm to people that you love by staying alert, looking for danger, scanning, being responsible, being in charge, and then reminding yourself... I never relax. Ever. My wife says right. I never, ever relax. I can't even, she tried to have someone give me a massage, but I couldn't relax enough to even enjoy that. I mean, I can't relax. If I don't drink two or three beers before I go to sleep, I, I won't even go to sleep. So you're saying that you think that's why I'm so, yeah, cause can't relax? When the news helicopter goes overhead, in the present, there's not any objective danger. Right. I mean, it's not going to crash on your backyard. So you have a reaction, so this is called the, a trigger. The news helicopter is the trigger. You have a reaction to the reality of the present that's completely out of proportion to the reality of the present. But it's not out of proportion to the reality of the past. When choppers were going overhead, bullets were flying, people were dying, to be very keyed up, hyper alert, looking for danger, in fight mode, completely makes sense, fits the situation as natural. 
So the pro one of the problems with post-traumatic stress is you're having a reaction to the present that's out of proportion to the present, but matches the reality of the past. So it's like you're back in the past reacting to the past all the time. So you're saying there's a, a, there's a part of my mind that shows me this stuff over and over to try to prevent it from happening again? Yeah, so you don't sl slack off, so you stay cyber alert, you spot what you missed last time. Oh, hmm. That makes sense. I just never thought of it like that. I didn't think there was a reason. I just thought I was being tormented by them for being such a horrible person and not... Well, the good news about looking at it this way is then you can work on acknowledging to yourself that in that situation you actually, in fact, were powerless and helpless, that you did the best you could, you don't deserve to be punished, and you don't have to stay stuck in the past as a kind of a memorial to your buddy. The best memorial to your buddy is to let all that go, let it be in the past, have the life that he never got to have the chance to live himself. To me, that would be the best memorial to your friend. That makes sense? It makes sense. I just don't know how yeah. to stop it. Right. Well, then, that's just kind of a sketch of the project. Now we have to get to work on how to actually make that happen. But I wanted to get kind of the preliminary sketch of the project first. Okay. Good. So then that's something we can work on together. Okay. Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad that you made it here. Uh, you don't look like you're too glad to oh be here, though. Oh, my gosh. Okay. I, my mom makes me so mad. Well, I what? do not want to be here. And you're, you're in eighth grade? Yes. You're 13, right? Yes. Okay. What does your mom do that makes you so angry? Well, I had to come here. I mean, she just, she's so stupid. I mean, she just, she thinks she knows everything. She does not know anything. Not about me. She thinks she knows me so well. She doesn't know me at all. Hmm. And why did she want you to come here? She says I'm being disrespectful. And that's not true? I don't think so. I huh. mean, she deserves it. How come? Because she's stupid. Oh, okay. Um, Have you met her? I've met her very briefly on the phone. But she mentioned that she has a master's she's degree. Con she's controlling? Right. She is um, rigid. Um, she has all these stupid rules. Uh huh. I mean. And you were adopted basically at birth, right? Oh, she told you about that. Yeah, she mentioned that. Yes, I was adopted at birth. Hmm. Have you ever had any contact or anything with your biological mom? My biological mom? Yeah, your birth mom. No, I mean, I I, I know it's because my mom won't. I'm sure she's tried to contact me. I mean, I'm sure she has mailed or tried to contact me. I mean, we're in the, you know, she could have done something. You can look on the computer now and track down right. adopted kids. So, I mean, I'm sure my mom won't let her contact me. I mean, that's mm. how controlling she is. Do you know anything about your birth mom? No. I mean, all I know is that she was really, very, she was very, very young. Do you have any, so you have no idea where she is now or what she's doing in life? Or? I mean, I would guess she's, I think she's probably in Europe somewhere, and I mean, I have one picture of her, she's very, very pretty, mm -hmm. and I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure she's great and really neat and probably real popular or famous maybe, I mean, she's... So if your adoptive mom stopped blocking you and your birth mom finding each other, and you and your birth mom got back together, what do you think it would be like? I think it'd be great. I mean, I think it'd be awesome to finally get to meet her. Right. Do you think you'd want to actually live with her? Like leave your adoptive oh mom? Oh my gosh, her? yes. Huh. Maybe and I think that's why my mom won't let me talk to her because what if I wanted to go live with her? Right. So you'd like to move to Europe? That'd be cool? Oh yeah. Huh. Um, I've always wanted to go to Europe. I mean, I think it's, I'm, I, I would love to be in Europe. I, have you ever been? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, I, I'd love to go. So you have a lot of... I think I fit in better there than here, really. I do. Could be. So you have a lot of positive feelings and thoughts about your birth mom. Well, yeah. Right. And she, well, you don't really know her, but you never had to experience a uh, birth mom being controlling or being all the things that your adoptive mom is. You never had any negative experience about her. 
So you just kind of have the positive. Towards my birth mom? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Do you ever have any kind of feelings of negative feelings, anger, resentment about your birth mom at all? Ever? No. I mean, for a long time, I really didn't think much about her at all. And then as I've gotten older and um, I'm mature now, I just, I, I, you know, I just feel like I'm dealing more with, I just look at the bigger picture and I think about her more. I think that's probably natural. You never have like a little inkling of any kind of resentment that she hasn't found you or that she gave you oh, up? Oh, I think or? she tried. I just think my mom oh, okay. has interfered. Right, right. Have you ever had any positive feelings about your adoptive mom? She's okay, but I mean, it's just gotten really bad. I mean, there's a show I want to watch. It comes on at 1030. I mean, all of my friends watch it. They can stay up. School night? Yeah, but come on. I'm 13. Give me a break. I can stay up a little bit later. Right. And your other friends do wa stay up that late and watch Yes. Them? So your mom's a little bit strict. A little? I mean, come on. She wants me to be in bed by 9. Right. Um, she says a bad influence, that the movies, the shows are a bad influence. So whether she's right or wrong, whether she's over strict or not, would you say it's true that she's not a perfect person, but she has your best interest at heart at least? She's trying to protect I you? I just think she wants to control me. I don't oh. think she has my best interest at heart. Why do you think she adopted you? Who knows? And so, I mean, she's been there all the way through. She couldn't have kids. I know that. Right. So she just, I mean, I guess she just wanted to get a kid. Has she That's kind of you? selfish, don't you think? Just to want a kid? To adopt a kid just because you want one? Why is it more selfish to adopt a kid than to get pregnant yourself? Because you want a kid? What do you mean? Well, if you, so you want a kid. Yeah. So you adopt a kid. Yeah. What if you want a kid so you get pregnant? Why is it less selfish to get pregnant than to adopt? Oh. Well, I mean, if you get pregnant, that just kind of happens. But I mean... Yeah, but, well, what if you get pregnant on purpose because you want to have a kid? That's well, not then I guess you're supposed to have a kid. But if you don't get pregnant, maybe there's a reason. So what would have happened if your mom had not adopted you? I guess it, somebody else would have, I guess, till my mom found me and hopefully they wouldn't block my real mom from trying to find me and they would let me go live with her. But up until the time where your real mom found you, if nobody adopted you, you'd be an orphan. For a little while. She, she probably would have come around. I'm well, sure she's been blocking her for a long time. Okay, since you were a little, little maybe. Who's that girl in that picture? Uh, that's a girl who, uh, well, she's just a made-up girl. It's just a painting. Oh, it's, it's not a natural you know. girl. No. Oh, did you paint those? No, an artist painted them. They're pretty. Sure. I couldn't paint anything remotely as good as that. And it's showing. Actually, I'm glad you asked that because the painting is showing two sides of that girl, kind of a happy in the sunlight side, side, and a more sad, dark, traumatized kind of side. And I'm wondering if that applies to you in any way. Here's what I mean by that. It seems like you've, of course, everybody has positive feelings and negative feelings in life. And everybody has positive and negative feelings about their parents. Some people have tons of negative and not much positive. Some people tons of positive, not much negative, depending on what their parents are like. But everybody has a bit of both. So you seem to have all of your positive feelings on your birth mom and pretty much all of your negative feelings on your adoptive mom. So I'm wondering whether there's actually a little bit of the opposite there. I'm wondering if maybe you at least a little bit love your adoptive mom and a little bit you're angry and resentful at your biological mom, like anywhere underneath. You ever feel any hint of anything like that? I mean, I don't, I don't hate my adopted mom. I don't hate her. I don't, I hate, I don't like calling her my adopted mom. She just, she's just been my mom. Right. Um, I don't hate her. Sometimes she's okay, but it's just lately she's gotten a lot worse. I think, I think she's having a harder time with me being a young woman. No doubt. 
and teenagers often notice that their parents got worse. <laughs> so that's just part of being a teenager. How well, then that's her issue, and she should be in here talking to you. Uh, maybe. Maybe that's the, the way we'll go, go with her? this. Not for a minute. Uh, how about, though, the flip opposite? Any kind of negative, I know I've already asked you, but any kind of resentful, negative, angry feelings about your biological mom? Never? Well, I mean, I have thought, even if my mom stopped her, why didn't she just come at the door and knock on the door? Why didn't she just go to school? Well, I mean, she, you know, she can track me down if she tried harder, but I just think it's my mom. So when you're asking yourself that question, why hasn't your uh, birth mom tried harder, you just make the block by your adoptive mom be bigger and bigger and bigger so no human being could possibly get around it? But I mean, I don't really know why. Well, maybe the answer doesn't have to do with your adoptive mom at all. Maybe your biological mom just hasn't tried to find you. Oh, I don't think that's right. No? If you even consider that, how does that feel? I don't, I don't want to think about that. Why would she not want to find me? I mean, I'm a great kid. True. So if you think about she, that... She has to be wanting to find me. And if, just hypothetically, if she's not, how would that feel? Like if she didn't care at all? Mm-hmm. Well, that's not true. But if it was true, just hypothetically, how would it feel? That'd be horrible. Right, it'd be really sad, right? Well, yeah, that's why I don't believe it. Right. So I think it's just a sad thing to be adopted and not to be with your birth mom. At the same time, what a stroke of good luck and good fortune that a good mom adopted you and you weren't alone in an orphan all your life. So there's kind of just two sides to it. Just from the structure of the situation, it's something you can't escape. There's always, what if I was with my birth mom, things would be much better. And then there's all, oh, my adoptive mom's got rules and this and that and the other. And then at the same time, there's, well, thank goodness, my mom was there to adopt me and take care of me and love me, so somebody did. And my dumb birth mom didn't care enough. So there's like, there's two sides to both moms. And it's hard to sort well, all those like feelings out. I don't like that one. I don't no, like I'm thinking sure that. Don't. I don't like thinking that. But that may, makes me feel really bad. I don't like to think that one. But sometimes if we look into these underlying feelings and talk about them and resolve them, process them a little bit, change the way we're looking at things, then life can improve. Because maybe if you could tolerate some of the negative feelings about your birth mom, you wouldn't have to have so many negative feelings about your adoptive mom. There wouldn't be so much conflict with her in the present. Also, sometimes she may be over strict and, and we can meet with her and talk to her about that. Would you please? Because this is, I mean, it's just, it's really ridiculous. I mean, I am, I mean, I'm a young woman. She's just going to have to accept that. Oh, you basically, yeah, she's going to have to. Because you're not going to start growing in reverse and be eight years old five years from now. Seriously, I think you need to talk to her. Okay, I can do that. But I basically just wanted to say hi and get to know you, like, real briefly. And then we can uh, bring your mom in and have a discussion with her and figure out where to go from here. I mean, do I have to come back? Most likely that'll be my opinion. Okay, well then I don't need to come back. Okay, well that we can talk about with your mom too. Great. Okay, so hold on a second, I'll go get her. Okay. Uh, so your mom asked me to see you because she's concerned about your relationship with your boyfriend, which, which I know nothing about. Right. Mm, but that's the reason that she asked you to come in. Well, she had a horrible relationship mm. growing up, so, and it wasn't so hot with my dad, so I think she's just like worried mm. too much that I'm not in a good relationship because that's what happened to her. And how long have you been dating this guy? About six months. Okay, and how's it going? I think it's great. I mean, I, I love him dearly. And he treats you okay? Yeah, he treats me great. I mean, I'm hoping we can get married. 
What do you like about him? What are his good points? He's really good looking. That's a starter. Um, I mean, he's really talented. He um, he plays football. He's one of their best players. Um, I mean, he has lots of friends. He's funny. He's sensitive. He he makes me feel really good about myself. How does he do that? Oh, he's very complimentary. I mean, he just. What does he compliment about you? I mean, just how pretty I am and how nice I look and my my um, clothes and I mean just he's very complimentary of me I've never had anybody to make me feel so special I mean he talks about how, how beautiful I am all the time good sounds like a pretty good guy to be dating um, your mom also said she has some kind of concern that you might possibly have some kind of eating disorder oh, it's just my mom she just worries too much. I mean, if you don't eat three meals a day, there's something wrong with you. So, I mean, she's just, you know, you get kind of busy and I've got all this stuff with classes and I mean, I have straight A's. I do really, really well. And, and um, I mean, I just, she shouldn't worry. I mean, I do, I make great grades, but I have to study a lot. Naturally to get straight A's. And so I just, sometimes I study and I lose track of time and I don't eat lunch or I don't eat dinner or, you know, I'm busy. And then do you get hungry? Well, at some point, yeah, yeah. And then do you ever, when you haven't eaten for a while and you're getting hungry, do you ever eat excessively, do you think? Well, yeah. It's like I'm, it finally hits me and I'm just starving, and so then I, I eat a ton, but what, I cannot keep what doing is a, that. A t what does a ton equal? I mean, it's a lot. Like, just kind of briefly describe. I mean, like, you want me to say exactly what I eat? In Yeah, when you've been not eating for quite a while and you've been distracted and then you get really hungry and you really pig out, what would that consist of? Depends on what I'm craving or what I'm in the mood for. Give me a typical example. Well, the last time, now I don't normally do this. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen that often, but I mean, last time I went and I had went to McDonald's and I got supersized everything and I had like the Big Mac, the big thing of fries and large drink and um, the apple pie and some ice cream afterwards. And just before you started eating, how were you feeling? What were you thinking about? I don't know. Um, like the last time yeah. this happened? Oh, uh, uh, well, uh, okay. Uh, I mean, no couples are perfect, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know everybody's going to sure. argue a little bit. and um, I mean, Roger and I were arguing a little bit about something, and not really arguing, I just kind of listened. He was kind of, I mean, I just want to look really nice for him. Mm -hmm. I just want to look really nice for him. And sometimes when we argue, I just, I don't know. It, it just, it scares me because I, I don't want to lose him. What, well, arguing might do it, but what are you afraid would be the thing that would be most likely to make you lose him? Um. I don't know. I think it's. I think it means a lot to him. I mean, he's like you know, a big football guy. I think it means a lot to him that his girlfriend take care of herself and mm -hmm. has some self respect and look nice. And right. I think. I mean, I think it's real important to him that I look nice. What do you think would happen if you gained weight? I don't. I don't want to gain weight. I don't want to. I but, don't. But if you did, how would he react to that? Well, I mean, there's a lot of. I mean. You know, I mean, you're a guy. I mean, guys have, like, expectations of how girls should look. I mean, I just... So if you did gain weight, he might react how? Well, it may bother him. And if it bothered him, he might do what? Would he say something, do something, or just be bothered? Well, I mean, he makes... He will he'll will say little things from time to time about, you know, so you really shouldn't eat that or something. He's just trying to help me because he knows mm -hmm. it's important. So he's just trying to help me. Right, which is fine. But if you did, in fact, gain weight, what are you afraid might happen? Concerning well, I Roger? I don't want him to start looking at other girls. Um, cause, I mean, I'm not the prettiest girl in the school. I don't want him to start looking at other girls. So basically, if you gain too much weight, you're afraid that he might leave you for some other girl. Well, maybe. Which is a very common concern of teenage girls, not to mention adult women. So. If he really loves you, why would he leave? How much weight would you have to gain for this to happen? Well, I don't know. I, d I haven't uh, asked, or I don't know. Two pounds, five pounds, 50 pounds? No, I, I mean, I mean, I can see a big difference in my body. I mean, I know it sounds crazy, but I can see a big difference when I gain two. 
I mean, oh, okay. it really does show. And that would be noticeable to him. Oh, yeah. I can see it. So even a couple of pounds might be enough for him to start looking at other girls. Well, he would just want to know that I'm doing everything I can to stay healthy and that I'm going to lose right. it. But if you weren't, then his eye might start to drift a bit. Well, I mean, I'm sure it's hard for guys because, I mean, there's a lot of right. really pretty girls. and Okay. And so then that makes me think, and so we're basically talking about your perception of him here because he's not here to you know, talk for himself. But it sounds like you feel like if you gained maybe even two pounds, there wouldn't be an other features of you to hold him in the relationship that he values your clothes, your looks, your appearance, your weight, but you as a person and your hopes, your wishes, your dreams, your character, that doesn't really quite count for enough because if you just gained a few pounds, he might look elsewhere. That seems well, to be how you see it. Well, I mean, but also his, I mean, his parents want him with this other girl. His parents oh, think okay. he'd be a better fit with Gloria just because they go to the same church. Okay, so there's other reasons to be concerned about it. Yeah, I mean, his parents like her basically more than me. What do you have to do to earn your parents' love? Earn my parents' love? Mm -hmm. What do you mean earn their love? Well, what do you have to do so that they're proud of you and give you strokes? Oh, proud and, of me? Yeah. Um, I, think they're, I think they're proud of me. I mean, I... I because of what? Oh, I mean, I make, I make excellent grades. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I, I have a shot at Valedictorian, so I mean, I, I make oh, very cool. good grades. Congratulations. And so they're proud of your grades? Yeah. Are you in sports at all? Yeah. I'm in volleyball, and I'm pretty good, and I'm do cheerleading, so. Oh, okay. Oh, so you're very active. And how about your parents, your weight? Oh, my gosh. They don't put pre Are you talking about, like, my parents? Mm -hmm. No. They, my mom's uh, worried because I get too, I'm too thin. I mean, she's. Oh, okay. And. But just, she was just as skinny when she was my age. Was she? She's just gained weight over the years, oh, okay. which I am not going to do. I'm going to stay on top of it. Right, right. What's the kind of general atmosphere in your house? Are your parents very kind of emotional, touchy, feely, huggy? Well, my parents huggy? are divorced. My dad's not there, so it's oh, just, okay. I mean, I see him all the time. How long ago did they split up? When I was 12. And before that, when you were all in the same house, were they kind of emotional, touchy, feely, expressive, huggy kind of people? No. No, no? So what was the kind of emotional tone? Um, what are my options? Kind of distant, disconnected, everybody's there but not really emotionally bonded or interacting versus the opposite is very emotional, very you know, connected, very bonded, a lot of nurturing and affection. i more towards like the first one. Okay. And so the thing that, there wasn't just... I mean, they're both really kind of quiet. That's what's right. so weird is they're, I'm like all over the place and like to talk and I put myself out there and I wouldn't say they're... They're both kind of shy a little bit, mm -hmm. so it's it's real weird to them that I like to be in the spotlight because neither one do. Well, people just have different temperaments. We know that. So, but to get some, it sounds like to really get some positive feedback and actually hear out loud from your parents something positive, you have to perform pretty well. Well, it's really important because my I mean, right. my mom is very very smart. Right. Um, I mean, she, she put herself through, through graduate school, and she's a CPA, and she works very, very hard, and she does, I mean, she works with a lot of people. Do you know what unconditional love is? Do you know that term? Yeah. Right, so that's love that you don't have to earn. And right. So it sounds like, I, I understand that your parents, like, are employed, and you have a good house, and there's food on the table, and you have clothes, and you're provided for, but it sounds like your home is not an atmosphere of really warm, unconditional love that you actually experience that actually flows through the relationships? Well, I mean, you have to do your, you have to, I'm, you have to do your part. I mean, you have sure, to. Sure, of course you do. And so I just, I just know it means a lot to my parents and me too that you make good grades because it's all, it, you know, it's really about, they want me to succeed. Which is good, which is positive, but it seems, I'm getting the impression that if you don't earn all of that, there isn't much just basic love there. It's all something that you have to kind of earn through good performance, good behavior, good appearance. I think that appearance. they love me no matter what, but I think they really are really proud of me right. for my grades. Well, I'm sure they do love you. I'm, all I'm saying is that it sounds like 
they're not real touchy, heavy, yeah. feely people. It doesn't if really that's what come asking. across right. concretely to well, you. Well, they're not. They're not touchy feely. Right. So, do you ever get the feeling from that that maybe you're not all that lovable? Do you feel that way about yourself at all? I don't think so. The reason I ask is, you now it could be all about. I think you have to do stuff. I mean, I think you have to. You have a. You have your part you're supposed to do, and I think, you know, like I'm, I have responsibilities. Sure. If you just sit there doing nothing, nobody's going to want to date you. So, I understand And maybe don't love you. Right. But it sounds like your core belief is you're just not intrinsically lovable enough if you don't keep the grades up, don't keep the right clothes on, don't keep your body weight right. There's just not enough there to hold Roger. He's going to stray and look the other way. Now, I realize that could be mostly about him. And that's true of a lot of guys, but I'm getting this sense that deep inside you don't quite feel intrinsically lovable enough. You got to earn it. You got to look right, behave right, perform right. Well, I just call that being responsible. Oh. Okay, so just one more thing I would like to touch on then, and this is a little bit of a hypothetical. So, how do you think you would feel if you did gain two pounds by mistake, and then Roger left? Oh, I feel terrible. I love him. Right. How would you feel about yourself? First, you'd feel bad about the situation. You'd miss him. But how would you feel about yourself? I'd probably be very angry at myself for um, being so stupid that I couldn't keep him. Hmm. Would you ever think, boy, maybe I'm just not attractive enough? Yeah. I don't mean physically. I mean as a person. Well, isn't that, what do you mean? Like I'm not more your character and your spirit and your emotions and your mind, as opposed to your body. Yeah, I mean, I, if I was enough of all of those things. Okay, so it's not just about good enough grades, good enough body, good enough clothes. It's also about being good enough just as a person, just who you are, character-wise, emotionally. You know that has to be a little bit true because. Carol is, I mean, she's kind of heavy. Who's Carol again? This this girl on the squad. She's like, one, she's the biggest cheerleader out there. And I mean, there's a lot of really, a lot of guys that are after her. And they, it doesn't, I never have been able to get it why she's able to attract all these guys. I mean, she's not that skinny. So I don't, I mean, there's so something, but that's... she's real, she's real fun and bubbly. Well, maybe guys value that and are willing to overlook the overweight more than you're thinking. Yeah, I think she's just extremely lucky. Hmm. What would happen again if you, say, you just got B's and C's one semester? How would your parents B's react? B's and C's? Uh-huh. Oh my gosh, they'd be very upset with me. They'd be very disappointed. And what would they say? Uh. Well, first of all, they would wonder what the heck has happened and why I'm not being responsible anymore, but I mean, they'd be very disappointed. I would hate to put them through that. So then you'd be the bad daughter who caused your parents to feel the pain of disappointment? Yes. Oh, yeah. So it would cycle around till you hurt them? Well, it would hurt them, yeah. Right. It would be me hurting them. But it would, do you think the emphasis would be more on their concern for you? or their concern for you hurting them. Say that again? Do you think they would be more focused on what's wrong with you, what's troubling you, what do you need, oh. or would they more focused on how upset and disappointed they are because you've hurt them? I think probably both, but I think they'd be really struggling with what's wrong with me, what have I done? Okay. So if you're not performing up at this level, then there's something wrong with you, you're defective. Kind of, yeah, because they know and Does that equal not lovable, not worthy? I would feel unlovable. Right. So I think that's going to be something that we're going to have to talk about at greater length, that rumbling around in there is this kind of sometimes there, sometimes not there, sometimes ignored, sometimes buried feeling that unless you're performing, 
unless you're getting the grades, unless you're on the cheerleading team, unless you're proper weight, unless you got the right clothes, you're just not worth loving. Wow, so I would like, feel that way. I mean, I, I could very easily feel that way. Okay, so that's something we need to talk about a little bit more. Okay. Good, so I'm, I'm glad we at least got that identified because that's something we'll be focusing on for a while here. Is that not normal? Sure, to a degree, but it seems like your life is a little bit more painful and a little bit more on off track than it could be if you do a little work on things. Okay. I mean, you're not, like, I'm not talking about admitting you to a mental hospital or anything like that. This is more like a little adjustment that we're talking about, just so things could be a little bit better. Like to help my self-esteem? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay, so I'm glad you came then. Okay. So, uh, I, I know a little bit from the intake information, but what's the main reason that you're here? I just, I just need someone to help me with my panic. I mean, I'm just having panic attacks all of the time now. And are they about anything? Are they connected to anything? Well, it all started when my 10-year-old, I mean, she wants to have a birthday party. Mm -hmm. And she wants me to have um, to have these clowns come. She loves clowns, and I've never told her this, and I've tried not to even make her feel uncomfortable. But I totally freak out when I see clowns, or when I, I just I don't I don't have anything hmm. to do with them. It makes no sense. I have no idea why they just freak me out. So freak out means you feel how? Oh my gosh! Like I'm gonna have a heart attack. I can't catch my breath. My head starts spinning. I start sweating. It's horrible. It's like and totally embarrassing. Would that be like even if you would see a clown on TV? Yes. So it doesn't have to be in the real world. Uh, uh, like on a no, mo no, no, it movie, can be TV, magazines, anything. Magazines. And how long? Have I you mean, that, that Stephen King movie, It. Did you hear about it? I've heard of it, but I haven't watched it. Oh my gosh! I mean, that would totally send me off. It's all about this crazy clown. I mean, I hmm. cannot see stuff like that. But even just like a normal, regular clown doesn't have to be a scary situation. They're all that scary to me. Right. Oh, That's okay. how I see them. And how long? You're 30, I feel totally stupid. 34 now? Yes. How long have you had the fear of clowns? My whole life. Huh. Well, that's not true. I mean, back till I was a little kid, though. It was okay. back till I was little. I can remember this is pretty far back. And how often, so do you have panic attacks that don't have anything to do with clowns? Or is it always a clown? No. Right? I, I mean, I don't have, no. It's just, and it seems like since she's brought this up, and it's all about this big birthday party, and she wants this birthday party to be real big and special, and mm -hmm. she wants all of her friends to come. There's all this emphasis. It's like it's just a full tilt. So even just thinking about she wants a clown yes. at the birthday party will do it. Yes. And so often with anxiety, there's problems with sleep. How's your sleep? Well, that's the whole problem. I mean, it's just, that's why I'm here. I mean, I would never, I've been scared of clowns for years, but I never really wanted to go talk to somebody about it because it's mm -hmm. like, you know, it's not that big a deal. But right. I can't sleep, I can't eat, it, I think about, oh my gosh, how am I going to get through this party? What am I going to do? I don't want to tell her no. I don't want to tell her her mother's scared of clowns. I mean, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. As you're trying to go to sleep, do you think about clowns? Yes, I'm thinking about all the stuff I've got to do to make this happen and how am I going to get over this and well, then so I just... It's about the birth, it's a pretty focused on the birthday party. Yes. With I mean, clowns tied yes. in. Yes. Okay. How about when you actually eventually fall asleep, any nightmares at all? I mean, I wake up in full tilt panic attacks. Hmm. Full tilt. And are the nightmares about clowns? Usually no. What? Well, n no, usually they're not. Usually it's just me, like I'm running and running and running and something's chasing me and I can't get away and I can't get away and I can't get away. Hmm. I mean, it might be a clown, but I don't see that in my dream. I'm just running, 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 looking back and knowing I'm about to be caught. I just, in my dream, I know whatever it is, it's about to catch me. And, and there's nothing I can do. Did you ever have a bad experience with clowns at any time? No. Nothing ever scary ever happened? or. No, I don't think so. Okay. I don't remember anything. So now the feeling that you have in the dream, describe that feeling again. Um, I mean, how do you feel when you're just like, someone's trying to hurt you or kill you or something, and you're mm -hmm. running, 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 and okay. you know they're about to catch you? What would that feeling be? Fear, terror, panic. Yeah, all of the above. And so that feeling that you have in your dream, have you ever had that feeling in the real world? 
Not counting when you're concerned about clowns? Uh, you mean just t terror or panic? Mm -hmm. um, Fear, can't escape, something's yes. about to get you? Yes, I had a car wreck, um, like, uh, I think I was about 27. I think that's right, yeah. And, um, I mean, it was pretty bad. I didn't get really hurt, but the car got so crunched around me in the the airbag got deployed. I was like so cramped in and crammed in there. Um, I can remember kind of having, yeah, I had a panic attack then too. And it was, mm -hmm. um, it was well, a horrible. Well, that's very understandable. That yeah, it was, I knew I wasn't hurt, mm -hmm. but just being so crunched in, I just. But you already had the fear of clowns before that. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So was there a time ever earlier in life when you had that same feeling? Which feeling? Oh, the being the afraid? Trapped, scared, somebody after you get, trying to get you, something's going to happen. Yeah. When was that? Um, it was a long time ago. I, it was a long time ago. When you were how old? Let's see. My sister was in college. Um, probably around 10. And what happened? Um, I was, um, I was molested. By who? This guy had, um, a brother of a little girl that I was, I was at her house. And was she a friend of yours, close friend? Yeah, it was her, par her, her birthday party. Uh, so was her, would be her 10th, 10th, 11th, 10th or 11th birthday party, one or the other? Mm -hmm. Somewhere around there? 10, she's probably 10? around 10. 10 or 11, I don't remember. And so somehow he like took you to another room or something or? Yes, he did. He told me he wanted to show me something. Hmm. And how did you feel when that was going on? I don't really like to think about this. I mean, how would a 10 year old girl feel when a 16 year old guy I could is? imagine, but maybe you could tell me. Well, I mean, he, he just pinned me down and it's not so much what event happened as what feeling did you have? I was terrified. Did you feel kind of trapped, like you couldn't escape? Somebody's trying to trapped. hurt you? He so, was on top of me. He was holding me down. Okay, so you were trapped. In, in fact, in reality, you were trapped. Mm -hmm. Something scary was happening. Somebody was after you. Couldn't escape. You felt scared and overwhelmed and panicky. And does that sound like a familiar set of feelings? Well, I mean... It's the same feelings as you have in the nightmare, same feelings as you had in the car wreck, and same feelings as you have when you're thinking about clowns. Yeah, but the clowns don't have anything to do with anything. So there were, at the birthday party when you were 10, there were no clowns? Not that I remember. So. I'm just constructing a theory here, but I'm pretty confident about it. First of all, the feelings are the same, we know. The feelings when you're being molested by your friend's brother, mm -hmm. feelings when you're trapped in the car, and feelings you have about clowns, and feelings you have thinking about your daughter's birthday party and there's going to be clowns at the birthday party. It's the same feelings, right? Pretty much. Yeah. Okay, so the feelings are consistent all the way through. The question is just how does it tie together? And it seems like clowns in a way have nothing to do with it whatsoever. But we know that clowns are connected to your daughter's party, right? Right. So, but it's not actually the clowns that are scary, I'm thinking. It's your daughter's party. But it's not really your daughter's party that's she's scary. she's 10. It's really the party back then. But it's not really the party back then that was scary. It was the molestation that happened during the party. When I was 10. So I think the only thing that there may not be an answer to is how did clowns get connected to the feelings you had when you're being molested? It's pretty easy to see how clowns could get connected to party. So it seems like somehow in your mind, the feelings that you had from the molestation got attached to the party, and then they somehow got connected to the idea of clowns, because clowns are often at parties. And you kind of like bump the feelings over and they got attached to clowns and you were afraid of clowns. But really that's not what it's really all about. That makes sense? 
Yeah. I mean, it's not a big leap to go kids party clowns. So this is called displacement. That's a psychological term for it. You just kind of, it's like if you're really angry at your boss at work, but you can't get angry at your boss because he might fire you. You come home and you're angry at the dog. That's where you, you displace the feelings from where they really are onto something else. And it sounds like you displace these feelings onto clowns. I wonder why I pick clowns. There doesn't have to be any particular rhyme or reason for it. Maybe, no, it wasn't a costume party, it was just kids. Nobody had a clown costume. Was there balloons? Mm -hmm. Had you ever been at the circus where there's balloons and clowns together? Mm -hmm. so, some, I don't think we have to figure out the exact detail of, it's not a big jump though to go party, balloons, clowns. I mean, they're pretty tied together. So I think there's just some association in your mind. We don't have to figure that out necessarily. I, I think you're right about her being 10. I think, I mean, just when I was telling you that story and remembering how I felt, I really think it has a lot to do with her turning 10. Right, and that's very common for mothers who've <clears throat> been molested at a certain age to have a lot of feelings come up when their child comes to that age, even without parties, clowns being involved at all. Simply being the same age stirs up the feelings in the mom. So that's why it's gotten worse on top of her wanting clowns at the right. party. Hmm. Right. Okay. So that all makes sense to you? Yeah, and I never told anybody about the molestation. I was too embarrassed. Yeah, it's a big weight to carry for a lot of years. Well, so I'm glad that I asked you these questions. I'm glad that you told me about it because now we can work on that. And then maybe get the fear off of the clowns, off the party, off of your daughter being 10, back to what it's really attached to, which is that molestation. And then by talking about that and processing that, maybe you can let those feelings go. And then the, the whole problem with clowns, parties, and your daughter being 10 will just kind of dissolve. Okay. Now that makes it sound easy. It's not that easy to do, but that's the basic idea. So that does make sense to you. Very much. Good. Well, um, very glad you came in then. Thanks. You're welcome. So your, your treating psychiatrist said he'd like me to meet with you because he's tried a lot of different meds for your OCD and it seems like nothing really helps much. I mean, that's the basic no, reason for your being here, right? It doesn't. Nothing so really does. describe your OCD a little bit to me. It's counting. I count all kinds of stuff all the time. Like what kind of stuff? Anything, but I mean anything really. But tiles, like tiles in the ceiling or tiles on the floor. Or my jewelry before mm -hmm. I go to sleep. I mean I just, I just count a lot. What would happen if you didn't count your jewelry before you went to sleep? I couldn't go to sleep. Because you'd be feeling how? Anxious. Okay, so um, do you ever count things like, uh, I guess there's many different things you count, but say if you're counting jewelry, do you count them just once? Or do you ever the have... The first time. Okay. Do you ever specifically have to count them like in sets of three or a certain number of times? Well, I, like my rings I will count, my bracelets I will count, my necklaces I will count, so kind of in their own categories. Okay. And each of those categories... Do you just count them once and you're done, or do you have to recount them? I wish I could count them once. I have to recount them. Any specific number of three times? Three times. Oh, okay. Three times. I thought your sky just mentioned something about sets of three. So then if you count three times, then the anxiety eases off for a while? Enough that I can go to sleep. Okay. And is that also true if you're counting floor tiles or something else? It tends to go in sets of three? Or not necessarily? Not necessarily. Okay. But the jewelry thing, that's what my psychiatrist, I mean, I, I, I cannot, he told me to just count them once and then to go to bed and see what happens. And I mean, I was so uncomfortable. I, I tried to do what he said. Right. Yeah, that's kind of an exposure desensitization type technique. I couldn't technique. do it. I tried. I could, but I couldn't sleep. And actually, the anxiety got worse and worse and worse. Okay. And how long have you been counting things? My whole life. So since you were a little kid? Like less than ten. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, have you've tried some cognitive behavioral techniques and yes. a bunch of different meds? 
And Mostly would, mids. Would you say it's kind of like steady or is it improving or getting it's worse? It's getting worse. Kind of gradually? Or did yeah, it suddenly get worse? It's gradually getting worse. Gradually. So there wasn't any big event that happened last year or two that made it a lot worse? No, just but when I get more stressed out, it gets worse. Right. Just general stress yes. of any kind? Yes, just general mm -hmm. stress. And then when you count, if you count enough or in sets of three or however it works, then you do get a relief from the anxiety for a little Absolutely. while. Absolutely. But not for all that long, apparently, because you have to keep counting. Yeah, it's and getting this worse. This is a daily thing? Oh, yeah. Right. Um, I almost had a wreck because I was counting the birds on the telephone line. Ooh, that could be distracting. And, I mean, I can't... Especially when there's lots of them. I know. There, and there were. And if you don't count correctly or if you think you've made a counting error, does your anxiety go Even up? if I know I haven't made a counting error, I have to redo it again. I mean, I have to do it three times. But if you either know or you're pretty confident you made a counting error, does that make the anxiety worse? Particularly? Um... I don't really think about if I'm in an error or not. I okay. just and so anything else like in a car wreck would be a pretty serious consequence. How other than just you have to do it a lot and the anxiety, is it interfering with your ability to function or? Well, I can't focus. Can't focus. Like at my job, if something right. comes up and I'll be in meetings and they'll be going over stuff and if there's something that makes me feel uncomfortable in the meeting like if there's one guy I work with who is so loud and if he starts getting loud I'll start counting and if I'm counting I can't hear what they say right so it distracts you from things you have to get absolutely done? and it's getting worse and my job evaluation was not as good this and it's uh, always really good w one thing I always ask about in the course of an assessment is about an inner child let me explain what I mean by that you've heard the term inner child yeah yeah so I see inner child as being basically on a spectrum. And so at this end of the spectrum, inner child is just a figure of speech, metaphor, way of talking. It's just some therapists use the inner child lingo to talk about some unresolved feelings from your childhood. But there's n nothing more to it than that. So purely figure of speech metaphor, which could apply to anybody, but some people can't relate to that lingo. At the other end of the spectrum is dissociative identity disorder or multiple personalities where a little child actually comes out, talks to I the don't therapist. don't have multiple personalities. No, I understand. I'm just describing the spectrum. And um, it's not just a figure of speech or a metaphor because there's different um, manner of speaking, different voice, different name, different age. And then the child goes back inside and the adult doesn't even remember the conversation. So clearly that's not just a metaphor or figure of speech. That's an actual behavior. And then there's kind of like all shades of gray in between. So some people just can't relate to the inner child thing at all. Some people go, yeah, yeah, I, I see that makes sense, but I don't actually have an inner child, but I see what you mean. And then the next person might go, yeah, yeah, I, I kind of can have an inner child. I mean, it's not really a child there, but I can kind of feel like there's a child there. And then the next person would go, yeah, yeah, I have an inner child, and I can actually visualize her internally and describe how she looks, what she's doing, what clothes she has on. And then the next person would say, yeah, and I hear her crying and I can actually talk to her inside. So there's kind of like that. all degrees. Do you have any sense at all of, it's like there's a child in there doing the counting? Maybe, maybe so. So describe that a little bit. Why do you say maybe? Um, does, is it the same thing if I feel kind of, like when I get anxious, I feel kind of small kind mm -hmm. of little. Is that the same thing? Yeah, that would be the same thing. So, yeah, I can, I've, that's the feeling I cannot stand. Do you ever feel like it's not the adult you that's doing the counting? It's more like you in this state of being little are doing the counting and it kind of floods kind into of. adult you? Yeah, kind of, because it doesn't make sense. Right. It, logically, it just makes no sense. Why would an adult have to sit there and count ceiling tiles? It's just stupid. But if you try and like suppress the counting and not do it, gets it, worse. it gets worse. So I right? have to do it right. so I can at least function a little. Okay. But I can't control it. And you said you were little when you first started counting. Yeah. And was there anything particular going on when you first started counting? I think just stress. I mean, our family was kind of stressful. Right. What kind of stress went on in your family? just all kinds of stress. I mean, just 
dysfunctional family. Hmm. Uh, okay, we have to time out. Is is this a repressed memory? Am I supposed to come no, up with it in here? No, I always not, knew this. Yeah, I always knew. Okay, so, so you're just a bit hesitant to mention it. Okay. So, so I say, okay, what kind of stress? And you can go, well, I was sexually abused by my dad. Okay. Just kind of bring it right out. Okay. Just to save time. Okay. Yeah. So a stressful family, was there something in particular that went on that was stressful? Uh, well, for me, yeah. What uh, was that? Uh, my father abused me. Abused you how? Sexually. From how old were you when that started, as far as you remember? Yeah, I don't remember when it started. So pretty young? Yeah. And was there anything that you would do to try and cope with that stress? Hmm. Yeah, I counted. So when the abuse was actually going on, you'd count things? What, what would you count? I actually would try to... My wallpaper had little pink flowers, and I would try to focus so much on those flowers, I kind of wanted to go and kind of like disappear into the wallpaper. And if I could count them over and over and over, it kind of helped me. I mean, I kind of felt like I went away into the wallpaper. It's almost like you kind of escaped your body and I went mean, into the wallpaper. I know that sounds stupid, but... It doesn't sound stupid at all. It's, a, it's called, the lingo in the literature is, it's called depersonalization, which means you're kind of disconnected from yourself and the reality of yourself. And people often describe, um, like in an adult rape situation, that they float out of their body. It's like they're watching themselves and watching the rape going on. And so it's not obviously literally true that you actually went into the wall. Well, but it felt like it. But I have to tell you, it felt like it. Right, so it can become very real psychologically, even though it's not literally real. And it's a very good way to disconnect from what's happening, protect yourself, not feel all the feelings. So as a psychological defense, it really makes sense. Well, the faster I could count them, right. the quicker I could go into them. Right. And then it's basically just a way to get away from all the pain and the feelings. And but that's not happening now. I mean, my father's actually in jail. Is he? Yeah. For, for what? He, molestation. He, oh. he, some neighbor kids. Holy. So he's actually in jail. So, I mean, you think I would, why do I need to keep doing it? He's not even, he's in prison. Well, now it sounds like you, if you're stressed at work, stressed whatever reason you're stressed in life, your anxiety level goes up, you've kind of grabbed on to counting as a general self-soothing technique. So this is called generalization. It starts off, it's focused on the abuse by your dad, but then it becomes kind of a handy technique for dealing with stress in general. So, and that happens commonly. It starts off, it's a way of coping with this, but which could be just like drinking alcohol. You could start drinking alcohol because you're being physically or sexually abused. Next thing you know, you start drinking to cope with anxiety at work, anxiety about this, anxiety about that. So that's generalization. Maybe that's why it's so much worse at night time too, because that's when the abuse always happened. Right, that would make sense. And from what you're describing, it seems like, I'm not trying to say that you have DID, dissociative identity disorder. Um, but it sounds like you're a little ways out on that inner child spectrum. And I'm thinking maybe there's like an inner child who's trapped back in the past and can't get away from the feelings and the fear and has to count and count and count and count and count. Oh. And so to whatever extent that's true, part of the work would be trying to get in touch with that little child, heal her, soothe her, calm her. Well, she's in the flowers if she's there. Is she? Okay. Because if you could do that and bring her into the present where things are safe and have her be more connected to you, then she might feel more safe, not have to do the counting, and then the con counting compulsion could settle down a little, or settle down a lot, which I've seen actually happen. Okay. So this inner child work, some people just can't relate to it, it doesn't w apply. But for some people it really is amazing how if much progress you can make by operating in this kind of inner child context. That makes sense to me. Good. So if you can relate to it, that's something that we can look into. Why didn't my doctor ask me about this? Uh, sounds like he's more, I mean, I know him a little bit. As far as I know, he's more of a medication-oriented psychiatrist. He's not so much in the therapy side of things. And the therapy side of things that he's in is more what we call cognitive behavioral, 
which can be very helpful for a lot of people. But sometimes when there's an underlying trauma theme, you really also have to deal with the trauma theme. Okay. So it's not that the things that he's been trying are totally useless or wrong or bad. It's just that they're not addressing the whole picture. Right. So if we can add on this part of the picture, maybe you'll start making some progress. Okay. Good. Well, I'm glad that makes sense to you. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, so the reason you were admitted was because of an overdose, right? Yes. And what was going on? Why did the overdose happen? I, um, I had a rough day at work. Um, I got written up. So it was just kind of a rough day. And the overdose happened at home in the evening? Yes. And uh, now I know that you have DID, right? Yes. And you have a therapist outpatient that you work with on that. Right. So, and uh, you're the host personality, I understand, right? Yes. Okay. Which equals you're the person who's out most of the time and you kind of take care of work. and. Right. right. So was it, obviously in the big picture, it was you, no matter how you look at it, your body overdosed, right? But was it you, the host personality? No, I didn't take the pills. Oh, it was one of your parts? Yes. And were you... When the overdose was actually going on, were you there watching, or were you totally blanked out and gone? Well, sometimes, I mean, usually when she takes over, I don't get to see anything. Mm -hmm. And this time? I mean, I saw it coming, but mm -hmm. then she just pushes me out of the way, and I can't see anything. Oh, okay. So were you yourself? I hate her. Well, if she's trying to kill you, that's kind of understandable. Yeah, exactly. Thank we're you. So I, we just need to, like, freaking get rid of them. Oh, okay. So you have, do you know the exact number of parts you have, or you have a bunch, or? I think I'm like down to about 17. Oh, okay. And is there any of them that you like at all? Or yeah, just... there's some that are real nice and fun and silly okay. and So but there's a bunch you'd like to get rid of? There's a, like, t two, really. Mm hmm Which includes the one who took the overdose? Yes. Okay. And why is it that you have DID to start with? because I was abused. Right. Well, I'm, I basically know the answer already, but you were abused, so then why did you develop DID? Well, what everybody tells me is so that you can survive the abuse, that your mind does this to survive the traumatic experience. So everybody tells you that. It could be true, it could be not true. Do you agree or disagree? Or well, I mean, make I, I, make, I don't know why else I have it. Right. That it's not genetic, they said. Right, as far as we know, that's true. So, the part that takes the overdose, what was her role back when you you were abused from what age to what age again? Well, let's see, which time? Well, how young were you the first time? Um, I think three. Now we're talking sexual abuse? Yes. And as far as you know, how old were you the last time you were sexually abused? Well, do you count date rape? Um, let's put that on the side for a second. I mean, inside your family or whoever it was. It was my father and his brother and my cousin. Okay. So that was a lot of abuse. Yes. And how old were you the last time you were abused by any of them? You know, it's it stopped when I started my period. Oh, okay. It's like they all talked to each other and said, hey, well, we can't do this so anymore. So it went on for close to 10 years. It was a yeah. long time. Yeah, yeah. And it happened a lot, not just a few times. Yes. And what was the part who takes the overdose, what was her role in all of that? I just think she's the, just the angry one. She just, she just hates everybody. Hmm. I don't think it ever happens. I've never heard of a family where everything is fine and normal, except there's sexual abuse going on. Oh, we're screwed up right. from all the way around. Which is always true. Yes, it's so totally dysfunctional. What would have happened if you gotten angry and started yelling and accusing people of sexually abusing you in your family? Uh, seriously? Mm -hmm. Well, they would have either said I was lying and laughed at me and, or they would have hurt me. Right. Probably so both. Wouldn't be a good idea to express any anger in that family? No, you couldn't. I mean, my cousin actually said he would kill my dog, so right. if I told anybody. Oh, okay, so that was a pretty direct threat. Well, yeah. 
And that dog was like all I had. I mean, it's the only, the only thing that I ever loved. Would you agree that it's humanly or even just biologically as a mammal, pretty much impossible to be in a situation like that and not feel angry about it? I mean, human beings are just designed. Yeah. If you abuse them a lot, they're going to feel angry about it. Yeah, especially when they got older. Right. So you'd agree with that? I would say in my teenage years, I was, I mean, I just sat around and daydreamed about stabbing them, killing them, how to do it. But you couldn't actually express any of that anger to them because it would be too dangerous. No, I just, I mean, I didn't, I didn't want to get around them because if I got around them, I think I would have tried to kill them. So what did you do with that anger? I mean, I don't, I just thought about it all the time. I mean, I still do in a lot of, a lot of times. Did you store it somewhere inside you? Yeah, I would say this part probably has it all. Oh, okay. So that would be kind of a presumptuous, mean, unkind thing to do for you, to hold all of your anger for you so that you don't have to feel all of it, so that you don't express it, so you don't get hurt worse. That would be mean and unkind to do that? For me to have... No, for your part to do that for to you. Just hold all of it? No, for your part to hold your anger for you. Right. So you don't have to feel it, and you don't express it, and you don't get hurt. Well, she has it all. Right. So her holding it all, is that an unkind thing for her to do for you? Well, in her mind, she didn't think so. Is that what you're saying? Well, what about in your mind? I just can't stand her. She takes the freaking pills. She gets us in the hospital. I'm going to lose my job because I can't. I mean, here I am in the hospital again. I don't have any more vacation days left. Right. I, I understand all the, the negative downside of her behavior, but I'm just asking... That's why I hate her. Right. That's why you hate her. But I'm asking a slightly different question. Do you think it was unkind, unpleasant for her to hold all your anger for you? No. So she was doing you a favor in that ex regard? Well, I guess, yeah. Okay. So um, just imagine for a second there's a family and there's uh, maybe three sisters, age six, eight, nine, and there's a lot of abuse going on in the family and CPS comes to assess the family and they talk to the eight and nine-year-old girls and they go, anything happened in your family that we should know about? No, the only problem we have in our family is our bad little sister is always getting angry. You should take her away. And CPS goes, oh, okay, well, thanks for explaining that. And CPS takes that little girl away. Well, it's the idiot to, parents. Well, uh, clearly. Do you think that would be a very nice way for the eight and nine-year-old girl to behave? Nice thing for them to do to their sister? Dump all the blame on her and get rid of her? Not when she's little like that. Right. I mean, that's just a little kid. And actually, she's the only one who's causing trouble. She's the only one who's angry. She's the only one who's a bad girl. But actually, she's just expressing the feelings that the other two sisters must have, but they've got them all suppressed and they're being good and they're not causing trouble. So she's really just expressing the feelings on behalf of all three of them. And for okay. that, she gets rejected and excluded. Yeah, but they don't realize that, apparently. No, but I mean, how do you think that would make her feel? Abandoned and hurt and sad, misunderstood, confused. So how do you think it makes your part feel when you do basically the same thing to your part? Hate her and try and get rid of her and exclude her? If she'd stop trying to kill us, I right. wouldn't hate her. It's real easy. But it's a chicken and egg issue. No, she just needs to stop doing those things and I'll stop hating her. She brings it on herself. Right. She's how old, that part? She's, she's probably about 17, okay. 16, 17. And she's you're how old? 40. So who's the grown-up? Who's the teenager? She's a teenager. I'm a grown-up. What's confusing about that? Nothing. But... Do you think that the teenager should take the lead on breaking the pattern or the grown-up? She's the one that's doing something that needs to be broken. Right, but so far the pattern hasn't changed. Exactly. So, so who do you think needs help changing the pattern? Well, how am I supposed to change her? She pushes me out of the way. I have no control at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm gone. She just pushes me. Right. And then she does what she does. What am I supposed to do? So she's feeling angry. I mean, just because she's 16 doesn't mean she's not powerful. She's feeling angry, retaliatory, homicidal towards you. Clearly. So the, here's the chicken and egg. I wonder if she's feeling that way partly because you're rejecting her, blaming her, and wanting to get rid of her. She brings it on herself. 
but maybe she brings it on herself. Maybe you're adding fuel to the fire. Okay, so what am I supposed to do? Just, well, basically do what I do, sit back and let her kill me? Uh, no, but I'm just trying to see the pattern here. So originally what she did was, she's basically what we call a protector. She's protecting you from your own anger because your own anger is too dangerous because if you express in that family, you get hurt worse. Plus it's just difficult emotionally to deal with. So she's, she's sort of like a time storage, maybe like a storage locker for your anger. And by holding it, there's a benefit to you. You don't have to feel it. Plus, you don't have you, the risk of it expressing it is taken care of. So well, I the couldn't because they hurt. would kill somebody. Right. So she took care of all that for you. And back then, that was very nice, and I appreciate right. it. Right. Okay. So that's where it all started. But then, for a whole bunch of reasons, we can try and figure out. I'm sure. But basically, it evolved to the point where you now are angry, blaming, rejecting, wanting to get rid of her, which has got to compound the situation, make her feel. Unappreciated. Are you saying I'm hurting her feelings? Yeah. Which is bound to make. I don't think she has any. She didn't have feelings. She wouldn't be overdosing. She'd just be going da 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 da. Nobody overdoses because they have no feelings. So you want me to make nice with her? Uh, I want you to look at the option of making nice to her and see if it makes sense and if it's something you want to consider. Because if you want her to be less homicidal towards you, less suicidal, less angry, less threatening, less overdosing. I mean, just imagine that you and I are social workers and we're called to evaluate a seriously traumatized and abused child. And we go, well, you're bad. We just want to get rid of you and throw you in the dumpster. She's not a child. Okay, we're evaluating a teenager who's had, got a long history of abuse and neglect. And we go, you're bad, we're going to solve this problem by getting rid of you. That's not going to help the teenager, right? It's not going to help the teenager be less upset, less agitated, less angry, less acting out. It's just going to add fuel to the fire. I think you could just lock her up. I mean, that, that and mm -hmm. contain her. What am I supposed to do to help her? She pushes me out of the way. How I mean, much, how do I help her? How much success have you had locking her, or her up and containing her so far? It worked for a while. It doesn't anymore. How's it been working recently? It doesn't work, obviously, okay. or I wouldn't be here. Right. So then if it's not working, we need to try so what do I do? something else. Well, what I'm saying is it's partly about what you do, but it's partly about your attitude and your perception. If you see her as wrong, bad, and nuisance, the cause of the problems, and everything be solved by just get rid of her, that's not actually true. I mean, if you could actually have a surgeon take her out and take all the anger out with her, I suppose that might be good because all the anger's gone. But there's no surgery for this. And the thing is, it's not just anger that's there for no reason. It's normal, natural, unavoidable, healthy anger that's when mammals get attacked, they go into fight flight. And the anger is the fight side of it. So what so do you, I do? Well, you have to give up on the idea of... It's first of all what you stop doing. You have to give up on and stop hating her and wanting to get rid of her. Because if the plan of action is whatever I can figure out, I'm going to do it, I'm going to get rid of her, then you'll just stay on that plan of action and it'll continue to not work. So the first thing is to change the attitude, change the plan of action towards Okay, so I can't get rid of her. I'm stuck with her. She's stuck with me. We're inside the same body. We've got to somehow learn how to live together. And if she's an angry, abandoned teenager who may be officially 16 or 17 but may not be functioning quite there emotionally, what does she need from a grown-up? Some acceptance, some understanding. You think she'll let me do that for her? I think it's worth a try. Okay. So you want me to just like, what, start talking to her or journaling with her or what? Both. If you were journaling to her, what might you say to her? I guess I'd say, it's in the past. I'm not with my family anymore. You need to get over this. So you'd give her a lecture? 
Well, what do you want me to say to her? You, why don't you tell me what to say to her? Because uh, I want you to brainstorm it up for yourself a little bit. I can give you some suggestions in a minute. But if you have an angry, upset teenager, I mean, if they stole a car or something or other. This is why I didn't have like, kids. I don't know how to deal with kids. Oh, okay. So you haven't really had that much experience dealing with actual this kids. This is why. I, I just don't, I'm but not around them. just using general common sense knowledge of life. If a kid's doing some big behavior, they may need a lecture. But if they're upset, they're angry, they're disturbed, a lecture is probably not going to do the trick. I mean, what do you think? The kid might hug need? them or something? Yeah. How do you hug her? Well, you may not, you can't physically hug her because she's not a separate person, but hugging can take many forms. Things you say, things you do, time you spend, just the kind of energy you transmit. So just by st stop telling everybody that I hate her, you think is like a hug? Mm-hmm. Okay. It's a little bit of a beginning hug. I'll, I'll try it. I don't know how it's going to work. I don't see how it's going to. I actually, so you would like to be integrated, I assume, right? If it means that they'll go away, yes. Right. And that's very common attitude for host personalities to have, especially a little earlier in the therapy process. And I call that integration by firing squad. Meaning... That's how you integrate? No, that's the way the host personality looks at it, which is kind of how you're looking at it. I want to get integrated equals I want to get rid of them. So if you came here and I said, well, we have this new method of therapy. We're going to take you out and shoot you, and then your alters can take over your body. Would you go for that therapy? No. So when you want to do that for them, they're not going to go for that either. Why should they? From their perspective, it doesn't make any sense at all. Well, that's the whole thing, is she wants to be here all the time. And look what she does. Yeah, but so do you. Yeah, so but I don't so take a, all the pills. I know, but as long as it's an internal civil war and you want to take over and get rid of her and she wants to take over and get rid of you, then there you are, butting heads forever. Okay. So you as the 40-year-old are really the one who needs to take the lead. That doesn't mean all of a sudden she could just act out any way she wants any time. That's not the point at all. But here she's held all this anger for you for all these years, and she's, she's done negative stuff recently, but for many years she's held all this anger for you. What kind of a thank you letter have you ever sent her? She probably honestly doesn't know what else to do. If I was being fair, she probably does not know what else to do. Probably not. I'll repeat my question. What kind of thank you letter have you sent her? I've not sent her a thank you letter. Think she deserves one? I can go with that. I can tell her I appreciate her holding the anger for all those years. Okay. One other thing I want to touch on is you mentioned that uh, you may be stressed at work or whatever, or some kind of stress going on, and she just kind of takes over and you go away. Mm hmm And that's how switching is commonly experienced. And it's also any addiction or any drinking problem or anything like that. People don't come into an AA meeting and go, I feel like I'm totally in control of my drinking, and I just drink when I decide to, and I don't drink when I decide not to. Nobody ever says that. They all say, my drinking's out of control, I can't stop it. So this internal feeling of, I'm not in control of it, it's not a choice, it just takes over and runs my body, is very, very, very common in all kinds of mental health problems and addictions. And it's very, very common as far as switching is concerned. The, the way you actually experience the switching is it, it's automatic, it just happens, it's out of your control. And if that was literally true and that was the whole story, you just be stuck with it. There'd be nothing you could do. The reason that you can get a handle on it is even if it's so automatic and so ingrained that you don't even notice it and it's kind of, quotes unconscious, there's actually a choice in there somewhere. That you, the host, make the choice to leave and not deal with whatever it is before they, to create the vacuum where the altar can come in and take over. I don't feel like I leave. I feel like she pushes me out of the way. And what's going on immediately before that happens? I'm upset. 
not just a little tiny mild upset, pretty upset. Okay. I assume, is that correct? Right. Because you don't, you don't have just like the tiniest little blip of upset and then switch. It has to be fairly big, right? Well, I'm, I'm fairly upset, yes. Right. And then she pushes me out of the way. And do you enjoy feeling that way? Well, no. So there's an advantage to you if you can be out of there, but you don't have to deal with the feeling anymore. Yeah, but it doesn't work to have her forward. When you come back after the overdose, how are you feeling? Or are after the overdose? Okay, that might be a bad example. So if she takes over for a while but doesn't overdose or cut, and then you switch back and you're there again, how do you feel then? I'm a little irritated at her for taking off. I mean, for pushing me away. What happened to all the bad feelings that were there before the switch? I guess they're gone, but I have new bad feelings of being irritated with her. Right, but as far as the old feelings are concerned, you have the benefit of they're not there anymore. Yeah. So you get the benefit of her coming out. So you think I like a user? Well, it's not that you use her because it's all you. Sort of like you're using yourself. I mean, it's all your mind. Well, yeah, but based it's on what we're talking about, it's I'm using her. You could look at it that way. But she's just doing her job and you're doing your job. Your job is to be the person who can only tolerate so much and then you're out of there. And her job is to be the person who helps and takes over. That's what DID is all about. Okay. Um, now, while we've been having this conversation, have you heard any comments from her on oh, that yeah. side? And what she had to say? Well, she thinks you're cute. Mm -hmm. um, she's just saying, he's right, he's right, he's right. Do you think that's an unreasonable comment for her to make? It's not unreasonable. Do you agree? I just wish she'd look at herself. Sure, but right now we're putting the heat on you and getting I know, to look and at she you. loves it. She well, likes I'm sure that. She does. How much would you prefer we put the heat on her? Well that's where the heat should go. Okay, I'm not supposed to do that anymore. So she likes it when the heat's on you and you like it when the heat's on her. So, yeah. So the fifty fifty. So but right now the heat's on you. So she's happy. But do you agree that basically picture I'm painting is correct. Well, the, yeah. Okay, so then you agree I with I don't her. disagree with anything you're saying. I just, it's going to be very hard to well, do. If it was easy, we'd all be out of business. There wouldn't be any mental health field. So you agree with me means you agree with her. Yes. So she's got a point. Yes. <laughs> you sound very thrilled to admit that. But that's what this is all about. It, instead of, it's like black and white. You're 100% white. You're the victim of her being the horrible black perpetrator. We're trying to see a few shades of gray. Maybe she's got a little white, and maybe you've got a little black. Maybe she's got a point of view, and maybe there's a couple of minor things about her point of view that might be legitimate, instead of you're 100% right and she's 100% wrong. And then maybe we can adjust it a little more towards 50-50 as we go along. Okay, I just need ideas on how to do that because this is like totally new for me. Okay. Is the session over? Uh, not quite. We're getting there though. Uh, she likes talking to you. Well, I'd be happy to talk to her in a little bit, but um, this used to be called horse trading way back in the 80s. Somebody invented that term for it. But it's basically making a deal. One part's making a deal with another part. In order for her to agree, let's just say three months, just pull three months out of the air. For her to agree not to overdose or cut or do anything like that for three months, what do you think you would have to offer her? What would I have to offer her? Yeah. Well, she'd like to be out more. Uh, how about if she was out more but not doing anything destructive or dangerous? She actually likes music. That doesn't sound too horrible. Well, you should hear some of the music she likes. Okay. Well, so you differ in your taste in music. Does she insist that you're... If she's out watching music, would she insist that you not be co-conscious? Watching music? Oh, sorry. Listening music. Okay. Do what, Neil? If she is... If she's out listening to music, does she insist that you not be co-conscious with her? Or would I she... don't know. 
I just try to hold her back. Well, let's say she made an agreement to come out, listen to music, allow you to be co-conscious, and not act out in any way. Yeah, but that's a big risk, Doc. You don't know what she's going to do when she comes out. What if she just says that and then she comes out and she hurts me? Why were you admitted? Because she hurt me. She's already coming out and hurting you. That's the problem. I... You already have that problem. I know, but you're just giving her permission to do it more. Uh, first of all, I'm not giving her permission. I'm seeing whether you would give her permission. So if you would give her permission to come out on the condition, of course she might lie and not follow through, but if you agreed that she could come out and listen to music with you co-conscious, as long as she doesn't act out, and if she were to make a commitment to no acting out for three months, you would make a commitment to letting her out as long as she doesn't act out, that might be a deal that both of you would go for. Well, she's saying she will. So you have to decide whether you're willing to take a chance on that or not. Okay. Good. Now, she's probably a little skeptical that you're going to follow through. Are you skeptical that she's going to follow yep. through? So you're both skeptical. Yep. With good reason, because neither of you have a history of being able to trust or partner with the other. So her being skeptical and uncooperative is really just the mirror opposite of you being skeptical and uncooperative with her. She agrees. <laughs> I just thought she might. Well, good. Well, so that's, you asked, what can I do? There, we've already started on what you can do, which is work on changing your attitude, changing the plan, changing what you say, making a deal. Does that solve everything? No, but that's a start. Okay. Well, good. Any final comments she wants to make before we take a break here? She I, just said thank you. Ah, well, you're most welcome, both of you, plus the other. 15 or so. Good. Okay.